This is Heart Rhythm TV, and I am Dan Alyish. Welcome back to the Ice Image of the Month. We are very, very honored today to be joined by Dr. Sam Asservatham of the Mayo Clinic in Rochester. Welcome. Hi. He is a master educator in our field, and his topic today will be structure and ice and imaging for VT. And truthfully, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Sam to start his presentation for us. Thank you very much, Daniel. So my colleagues and I just uh, thought about places where in VT ablation, including in the normal heart, ice has been genuinely key in facilitating our understanding of anatomy and avoiding complications. In the first area of value is in the outflow tract. The arrhythmia itself is straightforward in terms of presentation recognition, but the anatomy of the outflow tract is complex with the right and left outflow tracts crossing each other. And somewhere in between, we have important structures like the coronary vessels and exact distance orientation or inadvertently getting into a coronary vessel are very difficult even for an expert electrophysiologist to do with fluoroscopy or mapping alone. The first aspect where ice and anatomy go together is understanding the overlap and right-left orientation of the outflow tracts. The right outflow tract is anterior, hiding the left outflow tract with the pulmonary valve showing up anteriorly and to the left of the aortic valve. To try to understand this orientation, intracardiac echo can be invaluable. The natural orientation when you place an ice probe in the right atrium and look forward is a view that looks through the tricuspid valve into the inflow portion of the right ventricle. This view itself can be useful in recognizing right ventricular dysplasia, the moderator band, catheter contact. But as you see, you see that overlap as you open into the right ventricular outflow tract. Now, by opening this further, we see that inflow to outflow view and bridging or dipping into that site is the aortic valve annulus. So the aortic annulus to the inflow relationship for parahysian ventricular tachycardias, and then its relationship to the outflow for sinus valsalva tachycardia and posterior RVOT tachycardias. Now to transition from there to get a better idea of the left ventricular outflow is a very small move where we lose the RV inflow but still see the relationship between the aorta and the right ventricular outflow tract, opening up the left ventricular inflow for visualization, contact, mapping and ablation at common sites, for example, in sarcoid ventricular tachycardia. And in this view is an excellent view when we are mapping above the sinus of Valsalva to understand what are we making contact with. Contact force may tell you you're making contact, but that could be at a site of little myocardium, excess pressure against the valve, or inadvertent cannulation in a coronary vessel. Easily, the differential diagnosis is resolved with intracardiac echo using this view. The second level that we like to understand the complexity of anatomy is the anteroposterior orientation of where we're mapping. Sternum located here, vertebral body here. The anterior most is the outflow of the RVOT. An appreciation that the septum of the outflow tract is not a left or right structure, but a posterior structure. Because on one side, we have RVOT myocardium and the other, either the sinus of Valsalva or LVOT myocardium. 
how to appreciate this relationship between the aorta and the outflow tract. So here, by placing the ice probe in the right ventricle itself and looking up at the outflow tract, you see the outflow tract open and these structures that bridge between the outflow tract, posterior infundibulum, myocardium, coronary vessels, including the proximal left main, and then the sinuses of l -Salva. This view has to be understood very well to appreciate distance of ablation site to the proximal coronary vessels. Here's an example. Yes, uh, Daniel. May I ask you a question? So when you're mapping the arrhythmia coming from close to the coronary vessels, okay, whether it's left or right-sided, um, and you visualize the coronary vessels on ice, um, are you watching your lesions on ice at that time? And to what degree, how close do you feel comfortable ablating close to these vessels? It, uh, thanks, Daniel. I think it's two different situations. If we're doing an epicardial ablation, or a coronary vein-based ablation, and we're trying to judge the distance to the coronary vessels, ice in its usual form that is not in the pericardial space is very difficult to use for that purpose. And it's best to pick your spot to ablate and inject in the coronaries. On the other hand, the unanticipated site is when we're ablating in the posterior RVOT. This distance from the posterior RVOT can be variable based on the course of the coronary. So here, visualization is key. And if at all possible to try to avoid ablating right over the where the coronary is located. If it is no other way of doing it, five millimeters is generally safe. You will be watching the echo texture as you're ablating. Your ice settings should be changed to try to maximize the chance of seeing lesion formation. Specifically, the dynamic range should be increased to about 80 decibels. The mechanical index should be lowered to about two. And if you have possibilities to monitor the edge, that should also be optimized so you can see the lesion relative to the coronary vessel. Thank you. Now, sometimes you'll also see branching of the coronary vessels, and there again, you'll have to judge your distance to try to ablate. A third issue is when we have PVCs or VT, where we see an R wave in V1, yet it's mostly negative in lead one. So a little away from the right anterior chest, more towards the left, and an important site there is origin of ectopy, or VT that can be above the level of the pulmonary valve. Now this occurs because of myocardial sleeves that can extend above the pulmonary valve. And why ice can be very useful for these is the valve is opening and closing in life, making catheter contact difficult. So exact visualization here will allow you to target that muscle without necessarily being impeded by valve motion. So this can be done just with simple contact across the valve, or when this is recognized, the extent of the sleeve to loop a catheter to get uh, in the sinus area and get contact in the valve region as well. Now, one of the most difficult areas to understand and where ice can be of value is the cross-sectional relationship of juxtaposed structures at the level of the base of the heart. The key visualization piece, whether we're looking at ice from the tricuspid valve, from the bundle of his region, the ice probe in the pulmonary outflow itself and looking down at the aortic valve is to recognize the aortic valve and to try to be able to label the sinuses of Valsalva and then anticipate what structure lies next door. For example, visualizing from the tricuspid valve region, we view across the aortic valve. 
the most distant sinus of Valsalva in that view will be the left sinus. And that left sinus, we could see its relationship to the pulmonary valve and the aortic mitral continuity region. Now to get that view, we can come as in the, in the sinus of, a, in the tricuspid valve, but notice the ice probe, the apex of the triangle is close to the aortic valve itself. And this is the bundle of his type region where we're looking down at the aortic valve. And the more distant that you get away from the aortic valve, that's when we should start looking for the left-sided coronary vessels. Sam, uh, can yes. I ask a question about this image? Yes. Um, so going back, you know, one thing I that jumps out at me too is the relationship of the left atrial appendage to yes. those structures that you outlined. Can you comment about that relationship and also mapping of ventricular arrhythmias from the left atrial appendage? Sure. So if we look at, say, an ice probe that's placed here, and we look and we're able to visualize the left sinus of Valsalva and also visualize maybe the coronary vessels, the structure that will be in a posterior plane to this, but coming out and draping over the close to the left anterior descending vessel will be the tip of the left atrial appendage. Now to appreciate that view better, I'll just go back a few slides to this view here. So here, we can see this left atrial appendage, this kind of edge is bordering on the proximal LAD. So if we visualize the left main, if we visualize the pulmonary artery, slightly posterior to where you see the pulmonary artery, artery you should see the left atrial appendage. Now in terms of mapping for ventricular arrhythmias, this relationship has two purposes. One is if we are mapping and ablating in the RVOT and you see an atrial electrogram on your ablation catheter, that suggests that the left atrial appendage is nearby. And what that means is sandwiched in between could be the proximal left anterior descending artery. Another way is to actually map in the left atrial appendage itself to get an idea of far field activation of this region, one of the high points of the mitral annular region. But generally, it's not advisable to try to do a transmural ablation through the left atrial appendage. There is a single case report from Dr. Sosa years ago that showed that that's possible, but you have the problem again of the coronary vessels sandwiched between that site. So it's more of a marker and a mapping method, but for exact ablation, you'll have to pick your best spot and judge the actual distance with the left atrial appendage. So here you can see, for example, looking down further away, you see posteriorly the left atrium, vein of Marshall Ridge. And if we followed it out, the appendage would come and be in its tip anterior to the pulmonary outflow. For similar reasons, uh, mapping in the pulmonary outflow itself can sometimes be used to also map the epicardial surface of the left atrium. Now, uh, Carto sound, some of you may be familiar with, is more of an aid to memory. So the same role as 3D maps have for our intracardiac electrograms to prevent you from repeatedly visualizing the sinus of Valsalva, relabeling in your mind which sinus is which, where the coronary vessel was visualized. This can be done at one time. And as long as there are no large patient movements or changes in anatomy, it allows you to keep this as a reference point for mapping and visualizing your catheter as you continue to map or ablate.
Well, this concludes our first part of ice and ventricular ablation anatomy. The first part focused on outflow tract anatomy. And thank you all for joining us. And thank you, Dr. Asravathal.